Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. John's this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. A few announcements before we begin today's service. First off, we have an outdoor worship service this evening, 4 o'clock. Do note the time change. Now that we're in October, we've moved up an hour to 4 o'clock. Uh, bring your own chair. All are welcome. Of course, social distancing and masks must be worn. Next week is our Consecration Sunday, where we will begin receiving pledge cards uh, for financial stewardship for the year 2021. Please be on the lookout uh, for information if you haven't already received that about this year's pledge card, and prayerfully consider how God is calling you to dedicate your resources to the work of this parish. Very shortly this month, we'll be having a wonderful tea to benefit our fantastic camp and retreat ministry, Crossroads Camp. Hopefully you have signed up. There's still a little bit more time, but we, you must go on and sign up with your name and information so that we can bring to you uh, your tea kit. You'll have everything delivered to you safely, as well as a Zoom link to join us on October 17th at 4 o'clock for that wonderful virtual event. Really an important ministry, and we hope as many of you, men, women, everybody, will join us for that. The end of the month, we have a few things on October 25th. One, we are receiving winter coats and hats and gloves for the Market Street Mission through social ministry. Those items must be brought to St. John's by the 25th of October, if not before. Must have them in by October 25th. Also on that day, which is Reformation Sunday, that afternoon at 4 o'clock, we have an intergenerational Zoom event. Everyone, children and adults, are heartily encouraged to join us. Uh, join us on Zoom. There will be a video, singing, interactive activities, uh, and a way for us to gather together in this time when we are physically apart. Finally, on November 1st is All Saints Day. And this year, as part of our remembrance of the faithful departed, we're inviting you to submit to us ahead of time Names of any friends, family, loved ones that you have who have died since last All Saints Day, as well as a picture that we might include as part of the service. Please do email those to me before the end of the month. Friends, you are most welcome. Welcome to join us as we together proclaim a God who is living and active, a God who welcomes all. Let us stand, let us join in worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of the aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with a shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Reading from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everybody. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and have heard and have seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call on those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, look. I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, what a wild variety of texts we have today. There's that beautiful and poetic text from Isaiah in which we hear that God is a refuge to the poor and needy in their distress, a shelter from rainstorm and a shade from heat. And it's often read at funerals. Because this is a text about a God who prepares a feast of the richest foods and wine, a God who conquers death and will wipe every tear away from our eyes. And then there's that well-known and beloved 23rd Psalm that many of us could actually say by heart. Paul's letter to the Philippian congregation, the church whom he describes as the one he loves and longs for, his joy and his crown. That would surely preach in a time like this. 
For who among us doesn't feel assaulted and overwhelmed these days? Maybe it's the daily news about the pandemic and that ever-widening circle of those infected with COVID, including our president, the first lady, the former New Jersey governor, and that ever-widening circle of staff and friends near the president. Maybe we're anxious about the upcoming election, the increase in drug abuse and alcoholism is upsetting because so many people are self-medicating for their depression. And frankly, the growing number of people who are losing their jobs and their homes, who are food insecure and worried about where their next meal is gonna come from, it's really pretty upsetting. How do we in the church care for many, many people who are in need of life's basic necessities. These days are so hard that most of us could use a strong dose of what Paul says is that peace that surpasses all understanding. And if any of you can do what Paul encourages the Philippian congregation to do, to think about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, if you can do those things in the midst of our current experiences, please email me and tell me how you do it. Because even though I'm a pastor, I confess, it's hard to do that sometimes to think about the positive when we're so much surrounded with what's negative. So we have all these wonderful passages and then we get to the gospel. Honestly, it is tough to say the gospel of the Lord after reading a passage about a vengeful king who is so ticked off that the guests don't come to his son's wedding in the finest of wedding robes that he does all kinds of wretched things. Really, what kind of gospel ends with a poorly dressed guest at a wedding getting kicked out and thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth? Weeping and gnashing of teeth is not gospel. It's not good news. The guests invited to the wedding are a pretty sorry lot too. Some refuse to come to the wedding because they're just too busy. Others just don't care. Still others actually kill the king's slaves who were sent to invite them. And if the king in Matthew's text is God, then we are really in trouble. Because who wants to believe in a God who retaliates when he doesn't get what he wants. A God who is so petty and so vengeful that he'll burn down an entire city to the ground in order to appease his wounded ego. One commentator said that if they made a movie out of this text, it would definitely be a horror movie. I don't think any of us want to believe in a God like this. And in part, I don't like this description because it sounds too much like what we humans do. It smacks of our constant tendency to make God in our own image. So why does Jesus tell this story in such an offensive and extreme way? Maybe he needed to overemphasize these behaviors because too often that's how we human beings act towards God. Jesus invites us into a wonderful relationship with a living God, and we're too busy to respond, too busy making money, too busy attending to our own wants and needs. If we respond at all, it's pretty laissez-faire. You know, it's the I'll come when I want, give when and what I want, do what I want, and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God and the church, which are not the same, they can go on with somebody else responding to God's invitation. If this story is about the kingdom of God and especially about 
that final feast with the Messiah, then I think it's important for us to remember that God is the one who not only makes the guest list, but who invites the guests to the party. Sometimes we forget that. The servant's job is only to gather the invited guests. It's not to decide who gets to come and who doesn't. Now, in spite of the fact that the first ones invited refuse God's gracious invitation to come to the wedding feast of God's son, they were still invited. And when the invitation was sent again and the guests were too busy to attend, nevertheless, they were still invited. And they weren't even invited to a McDonald's meal. They were invited to a royal feast where there was the best of the fatted calves, the best of wine. And even when some of those invited eventually killed the slaves, those prophets that were sent to extend the invitation, the king kept sending the invitation to come to the wedding banquet of his son. But this time, the invitation was sent out widely. The servants were sent out into the main streets to invite everyone who was standing there, the good and the bad, and that's just what they did. They went out into the streets and gathered both the good and the bad, and when the guests finally started coming, they arrived with their wedding clothes on, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. I think we hear this passage and think that as soon as those people out in the main streets were invited, they ran right into the reception hall, but the text doesn't really say that. Weddings in Jesus' time often lasted a week. So when those guests got their invitation, they had time to go home and put on better clothes than the ones they were wearing in the street, even if they weren't pictures of sartorial splendor like I know some of you are. But they had time to go put on better clothes and come back to the wedding feast. I don't think, though, that the one who came to the party without his party clothes on was thrown into outer darkness just because he was poorly dressed. I think he was cast out because in not changing his clothes, he showed indifference to this festive event. He was going to go because everybody else went, but he really wasn't going to celebrate because it didn't matter that much. Truth be told, he would have been better off if he had just stayed away like all of those first ones who were invited and didn't come. Maybe, maybe there's a resemblance between this parable and the story of God sending Jesus to invite people into relationship with God. And it doesn't really matter whether the invitation was sent to the people of Israel or to the people of Matthew's day or to the early Christian church, or to the church in the 21st century, to us. I think what matters is the God who's sending out the invitation and what people do when they receive it. Remember, everybody got invited to the wedding. Everybody got invited to the wedding, the first and the last, the good and the bad, the worthy and the unworthy, the folks who were too busy to pay any attention to God, and the ones who were hanging out on the main street. For the writer of Matthew's gospel, though, being invited and going to the party are not the end of the story. It's not enough to go to the reception and fill your place with good food, something more is expected. And for the writer of Matthew's gospel, who really talks about the church, just being part of the church is not the end of the story. Some years ago, my friend Barbara tells a story about a pastor at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, Pastor Scott Johnston. He said during his weekly blog, The producer of uh, the Kardashians TV show called him at the church and asked if they could come and set up cameras and lights and film Courtney and Kim attending church. The pastor said no. He said that he 
said it nicely, but he said, no, they're welcome to come worship, but no filming during worship. So the producer called back and he said, listen, we really want to do this. I'm not a Christian, but don't you think we could just film the two of them walking down to the front and bowing and lighting a candle or something? Once again, the pastor said, no. Wouldn't it be great, brothers and sisters, if following Jesus were a simple matter of walking down the aisle and lighting a few candles and bowing our heads? But that's not enough. That's not what we are called to do as disciples. Now, whatever we do, we do as response. We don't do it in order to save ourselves. God has already done that. But we do so because we're so thankful that God has invited us to this amazing celebration of new life given to us in our baptism in Christ Jesus. We do so because we want to tell others to come to the feast. It's not enough to call ourselves followers of Jesus and then act as if we were sound asleep when Jesus said that whatever we do to the least of our brothers and sisters is what we do to him. It's not enough to say that we are baptized and confirmed, chosen by God to work for justice and peace in all the world, and then to turn a blind eye to all of the poverty and racism and brokenness in our world caused by so much human sinfulness. It's not enough to say that we're Christians and then stay silent when life and liberty and love are at stake. By grace, we have all been invited into the banquet of God's love and forgiveness. The, the wedding robe is what we put on when we accept our invitation to follow Jesus. So come to the feast of love. Put on your finest and come to the feast because God has given us the very best gift of all in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the Church, the world, and all those in any need. Gracious God, fill your Church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. Open our hearts and minds to new ventures in the Spirit. We pray for all bishops, pastors, deacons, leaders, and all the baptized people of God as they live lives dedicated to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. Restore valleys and mountains, forests and pastures, mighty oceans and running streams. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As you set a table in the presence of our enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace may prevail. We pray for our country, O oh God, during this difficult time, and as we prepare for a national election. Give us, O oh God, good government and leaders who serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. We pray for all those whose bodies are in pain, for those whose minds are troubled, for those whose spirits are downtrodden, and for all who are sick. We pray especially for those suffering from COVID-19 and its many and manifold negative effects. For Eleanor, Art, Hilda, Louise, Jean, Shirley, Dick, Jean, Joan, Pat, Margaret, and all those whom we name now. Mark, Kent, Rita. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our congregation. Help us to grow in faithfulness, mutual love, and understanding. Fill us with hope and peace found only in you. Bless every member. Hold our community together and bind us with cords of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, remember all those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet. Comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. And so we give thanks to God and we dedicate our tithes and offerings. Come, let us give generously as God has so generously given to us. So since the COVID pandemic hit, 
um, my need, especially for God and church in general, only increased. Um, obviously, times have been um, very uncertain, a lack of control, a lack of um, awareness of what the future holds. And one of the most consistent things that has remained has been St. John's and my connection to my faith and to church. I've felt very lucky to be a part of the processes that have helped uh, create the videos every single Sunday, um, as well as helping with the live stream. And I think overall that has not only helped but affirmed my continuous faith with church um, and with St. John's. I feel as though the community has only gotten stronger because of coffee hours, because of connection through Facebook, because of the live videos. And although we can't all see each other in person, sometimes being able to come to those outdoor services was literally all I needed during a week, uh, especially when I was still taking classes in the spring and now coming back for my, fall, fi my final fall semester being able to uh, tune in every single Sunday and see, um, you know, a sense of normalcy and a sense of, um, you know, my normal life that I wouldn't be able to get in a normal circumstance where we weren't taking videos and posting them online. Uh, so I think overall, just being able to stay connected uh, has been really what I've needed throughout this time. And St. John's has really been able to provide that and it's helped me stay connected both to St. John's and to my faith and really has affirmed uh, the place that I feel like I have uh, with God and my faith. From age to age, your voice will proclaim your faithfulness. Your love, O oh God, forever we will sing. From age to age, Use us and what we have gathered 
in feeding the world with your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and rest upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.